Welcome aboard the Evolution Eisenbahn, the train of life, where we go on guided tours through the tree of life to learn about biology and evolution. I am Sebastian, your tour guide. Today we will travel to a group of single-celled eukaryotes. Its members mostly live in pond scum and leaf litter, so you might think that they are not very interesting or charismatic, but I promise you, you will be amazed at what we find there and what they are capable of. So please take a seat, doors close automatically. Let's begin our tour. Now for the second time, we find ourselves on the track of the eukaryotes. They emerged some 2 billion years ago when archaea and bacteria combined to form a new symbiotic organism. And the bacteria turned into mitochondria over time. As I said on our last tour, in all of evolutionary history, this was maybe the most significant event ever. Well, at least from our point of view. So, now we have eukaryotes. But they're all still single-celled at this point. Next stop, by Conta. We have reached the first branching point and our first stop. This is where the bicons branch off, the first split in the eukaryote line on our map. So here, the eukaryote split into unicons and bicons. And this branching point marks the last common ancestor of these two groups. Unicons have one flagellum and bicons have two flagella. We've been here on our last tour, and that time we had followed the northern bicon track on our way to the plants. But this time we will continue east and follow the unicorns. Next stop, Opisto Conta. Here, the so-called opistoconta branch off. Do you know what an opistocont is? Well, you are an opistocont. All fungi and animals are opistocons. And the name means posterior flagellum. They have a single flagellum, as you would expect for a unicont, but in their case, the flagellum is always at the rear end and pushes them forward, right? You should know, since you are an opistocont. So, How's that rear flagellum working for you? Well, maybe you don't quite remember. You were very, very young when that mode of transportation was relevant to you. Yes, our sperm cells betray that we are indeed opistocons. And all our cells have the genes for this single flagellum, but most of them don't produce it anymore. Next time, we will continue here, but this time we go north. Next stop, Amoebozoa. We have reached our final stop for today, Amoebozoa Station. We are now in the present. So, what's going on here? Well, Amoebozoa are unicorns, of course, but they're not opistocons. So, logically, they should have a single flagellum at the front, right? But that's not really the case. Most Amoebozoa have actually lost their flagella, and some have two. And a new study suggests that the common ancestor of the unicorns actually had two flagella, one at the front and one at the back, which is one reason why the name uniconta, which means one flagellum, is actually falling out of favor. They're now often called amorphia instead. So look, I have to admit something here. All this business with the flagella is not as neat as I made it seem. Reconstructing the groups of these ancient early eukaryotes is actually very tricky. It's hard to tell who had how many flagella when. It's still an ongoing investigation. And the flagella are only one of the many traits we could look at. So currently, the evolutionary trees and the names of the groups change all the time. Historically, it was very simple. We put all the single-celled eukaryotes together in one group called protists. This was such a neat system, people loved it. Look, these are the classical 
four kingdoms of the eukaryotes. Protists, plants, fungi, and animals. Beautiful. But now we know that this neat system was pretty much wishful thinking. And it's way more complicated. All the protists actually belong to different groups. See? Protist groups are all over the place in the eukaryote tree. You can't lump them all together. And these are just a few examples. There are way more protist groups than these. But at least the amoebozoa, the station we write right now, they form a group that we think is pretty valid. They are a large group, very diverse. They have all kinds of shapes and lifestyles. But genetic evidence helped us figure out that they belong together. And now this group is pretty well established. And that's why we decided to put the amoebozoa on our map, while we left out many other potential protist groups, to keep things simple. This is how it could look like if we didn't simplify many more train stations. And we'd have to split the unicorns into Podiata, Amorphia, and Obazoa before we reach the Opistocons. And these groups aren't even certain. Question marks remain if this is even correct. So let's not deal with all that today. Just keep in mind somewhere that single-celled eukaryotes are much more complicated than it seems here. So, to get back on track, what are amoebozoa? Well, the name literally means amoeba animals, but I will translate it as amoeba life forms. And as you guessed it, they contain the amoebas. That is, the true amoebas. Many species from other protist groups are also called amoebas, because they look like amoebas. Again, it's complicated. But the most famous amoeba, the amoeba, if you will, belongs to this group. And it's called amoeba proteus. Maybe you've seen it already in some biology class. It's often studied there because it's easy to grow and it's easy to observe because it's so large, you know, for a protist. It's up to half a millimeter big. And uh, here's a comparison with a human sperm cell and a red blood cell. Amoeba proteus is much bigger. So what do you think about amoebas? You might think that they are simple and primitive, but don't forget that they're just as evolved as you and me and any other living thing today. Amoebas are very complex in their way. They might be only a single cell, but they make up for that. For example, they have a gargantuan genome, which in fact is 100 times bigger than yours, all packed into one nucleus. And they are masters of the amoeboid movement, which is named after them. The word amoeba means change, and that's very fitting because they change their shape all the time and move around by almost flowing across the surface. To do this, they produce little pseudopodia, false feet, with the help of their cell skeleton. And they are hunters and eat bacteria and other protists. Here you can see one engulfing a diatome, that is a bicont microalgae. And a little bit later you can see that it's now in the amoeba getting digested. And by the way, amoeba proteus lives in any ordinary pond. So they are literally pond scum. If you know a pond and you have a microscope, you can try and find one. Okay, what else do we find at this train station? Another prominent amoeba species has the epic name of Chaos Chaos. I'm not entirely sure why it's called that, probably because of its chaotic shape. They look very similar to amoeba proteus, but they use a trick to get even bigger. They divide their nuclei, but not the cell. So they are still technically single-celled organisms, but with hundreds or thousands of nuclei. This way, they can have much more protein production and sustain a huge cell. Some chaos species reach a size of up to 5 millimeters. That's much bigger than many animals. Here, you can easily see them with the naked eye. And they sometimes hunt and eat small animals. They just engulf and digest them. This is Chaos carolinensis, the biggest species we have found so far. And here you can see it hunting a paramecium, that is a large bicond protist. So yeah, Chaos 2 is just a single cell, but it's a top predator in the microscopic world. All right, what else do we have? There are also amoebozoa that have shells, you know, like tiny snails, same principle. They have shells that are made of hard materials like silica that are secreted or accumulated, and they protect the amoebas. These shelled amoebas are ancient. They exist for at least 730 million years. For context, animals only exist for about 500 million years. And we know how old they are because we actually found fossils of them. See? This is one of these fossils, and it looks pretty much exactly like some species that are still alive today. 
So apparently they are an evolutionary success story, haven't changed much in 730 million years. At least not in appearance. It's a blessing we have them, because they allow us to calibrate the molecular clocks that we use to study the evolution of the early eukaryotes. And finally, I want to talk about a species that, to me personally, is the most fascinating of the amoebozoa. They can do things that they shouldn't be able to. And that species is called Dictostelium discoidium. And fans often lovingly call them Dictis. Dictis are commonly referred to as slime molds. But even though they can be pretty slimy, they're not molds. Because molds are funguses, and Dictis are protists, of course. Right? They're single-celled organisms. Well, for some of the time anyway, but we'll get to that. At first glance, they are the most boring creature you've ever heard of. Just a little amoeba-looking cell living down in the leaf litter and hunting bacteria for food. And periodically they divide to reproduce. And that's it. Eating and dividing, eating and dividing. A humble life for a humble amoeba. But then it happens. At some point the food is running low. There are only few bacteria left, and the amoebas are starting to get hungry. And then one of them, usually the hungriest one, can't take it anymore and sounds the alarm. It releases waves of a signal molecule and creates a small pulsating beacon. A beacon that's a cry for action. And the dictys close to it, they hear the signal and they know what it means. They too begin releasing waves of the signal molecule to spread and amplify the message. Soon, Synchronized waves are pulsating throughout the whole population. And then it begins. All these dictys, who selfishly lived on their own, their whole lives, start to migrate. To the center of the signal pulse, towards the hungriest amoeba. Slowly at first, and then, like an unstoppable stream, from all over the amoebas come together. They coalesce and concentrate, and a huge clump forms. And they transform into a slug. Or at least into something that looks like a slug. They have formed a superorganism. Kind of like the zords of the Power Rangers coming together to form the Megazord. Only that this Megazord has 100,000 parts. And this superorganism really is super. It's way more than just a clump of amoeba. It's almost like a real animal. The Dictys specialize in performing different tasks just like the cells in our body. For example, the hungriest ones, they define where the front is, and they secrete a cellulose sheath, a slimy stabilizing skin so the slug can move. And most of the others, they form a swirling vortex that keeps the slug together and pushes it forward. And about 1% of the dictys, they take on a job as so-called sentinel cells. They patrol the slug and take up pathogens and toxins until they can't take any more and exit the slug and are left behind in the slimy trail to die. They sacrifice themselves for the good of the superorganism. And interestingly, as the sentinel cells get left behind, new amoebas take up their role to maintain them at about 1% of total population, for however long it may take. And thus, the sentinels are almost like the liver, kidneys and immune system of the slug. And the slug is moving, bridging gaps and ledges much too tall and wide for any individual amoeba sometimes even fusing with other slugs it encounters on the way. It has one goal, finding a spot for its metamorphosis. Because this isn't even its final form. The decision where to go is complex. It tries to go up towards the light, but it is also attracted by humidity, and it carefully chooses temperature gradients to follow. When it finds a spot, or when it simply cannot go any longer, it stops, and then the next stage is initiated. The anterior part, the head if you want, lifts up. And now these leader dictys, the hungriest ones, they are preparing for their ultimate sacrifice. They dive through the whole mass until they reach the bottom. You can see it here, how they're diving through. And the slug changes its shape into a sort of Mexican hat. And the leader dictys, they attach to the ground and then one by one, they transform into so-called vacuoles, so sort of a tight water balloon, which is very rigid and sturdy. But there's no coming back from this. They will die in this form. But the other dictys, they will make sure that their sacrifice was not in vain. They now climb up this rigid stalk that is continuously formed by their brethren. They climb up ever higher and higher, as high as they possibly can. 
and then they transform into the final form. They transform into spores. So that means they encapsulate themselves into a sort of shell that protects them from dehydration and they wait for dispersal. So now, here they sit on the very top of the stalk that was formed by their brethren so that they get a chance of survival. And now they hope for something to save them. A raindrop that splashes them away or a passing animal, you know, like a snail or a beetle or something, anything that transports them to a new home. And many won't make it, maybe none of them, but often enough their hope is fulfilled. They land in a new habitat and they germinate out of their shells to start their humble single life again. And so they live their lives yet again, only caring for their own survival, eating and dividing, eating and dividing. Until one day the food runs out and their descendants will have to leave this place yet again in search of a new home. And thus it has happened for millions of years down there in the dirt, unnoticed by almost everyone else. Now I want to give a little side note. When I talk about Dictis sacrificing themselves, or being hopeful, or caring, or some other anthropomorphic trait, know that I use this as metaphor. I mean, Dictis certainly are amazing, but they don't have consciousness at least not as we understand it. I often hear it said that Dictis show altruism, for example, but that is also just metaphor. And it's also just metaphor to say that genes are selfish. So please keep that in mind. All right, now, this life cycle of the Dictis is fascinating, isn't it? But let me tell you why it is even more amazing than you might realize. Think about it. They are single-celled beings and yet they can come together and form a complex superorganism, and yet they retain their individuality. So they get the advantages of being a multicellular life form without many of the downsides. Our cells, on the other hand, they're screwed, right? Because they only live to make sure that our eggs and sperm can pass on their genes, and all the other cells, they die. Or think about an ant colony. This is also a superorganism that's made up of individuals, but the worker ants also can pass on their genes, right? They are sterile, they only work for the queen, just like our cells only work for the eggs and sperm. Now, at least the queen is their mother, so they share a lot of her genes. So from an evolutionary perspective, it still makes sense to serve the queen, because at least you can help pass on most of your genes. But in our case, all cells have the same genes, of course. So from the genes perspective, it doesn't really matter which cells pass them on, as long as it happens. But for the Dictis, all that is different. Because they remain individuals and still cooperate, they seemingly break the laws of evolution. Their whole life cycle only works if some cells sacrifice themselves and become sentinel cells and stalk cells to protect and lift up the others. So how exactly is that breaking the laws of evolution? Well, imagine a random mutation creates a cheetah cell. So that is the cell that when it gets the assignment from the superorganism to form the stalk, it instead cheats and forms a spore instead. Then the genes of this cheetah cell would have a huge advantage. This traitor always ensures that their genes get passed on, right? While the honest cells don't get to pass on their genes every time because they sometimes help to form the stalk. So the cheetah genes have the advantage and they would spread like wildfire through the population. So soon all cells would have cheetah genes and no one would form the stalk anymore. Though, natural selection should wipe out any sort of collaboration pretty quickly. It's survival of the fittest, right? And cheaters are definitely fitter than honest cells. So how come it still works? Well, we're not sure actually. It's a fascinating subject of research and it ties in with the question how multicellular life could form at all given that genes are selfish, and given that it always pays to be the cheater in a group of collaborators. That is one of the reasons why there's so much research on Dictis. We are hoping that they can help us figure out why we are here, why there are multicellular life forms in a world of selfish genes. Before we wrap up, I have one more thing. What about sex? Yes, they can do that too. In fact, they have three sexes. For lack of better terms, they're just called type 1, type 2, and type 3. Each type can have sex with any other, so it works as long as two different types get together. We're not sure what triggers sexual reproduction. It doesn't happen often in the lab, but we know that it happens regularly in the wild because we observe that they mix their genes. 
as it happens in sexual reproduction. So, now let's have the talk. So, when two individual dictis that are of different sexes get down to business, you know, when they love each other very much, they give each other a special hug. So that is, they just fuse with each other and form a big cell with two nuclei. And then the two nuclei fuse together, just like the nuclei of an egg and a sperm would, in our case. And then the combined cell, which is now called a zygote, releases a signal molecule. The same signal molecule that is used by hungry dictis to call for a slug formation. So other dictis in the surrounding area, they come crawling to fulfill their duty to form a slug, but instead they are cannibalized. They're eaten by the large combined cell. So it's kind of a trap, but the victims come anyway, and they even help. They form some sort of cellulose wall around all of them before they're eaten. And a huge cell forms, a so-called macrocyst, right? That has all the nutrients from all these unlucky responders and has a protective shell around it. It's almost like an egg. And when the conditions are right, this macrocyst egg germinates and it undergoes meiosis. This is a special form of cell division to distribute the genes from both parents equally to the offspring. And then the offspring is released and has now a new mix of genes. And they start living their lives as usual, as individual amoebas. Isn't that baffling? So they even have sex and lay eggs, in a way. So I really wonder what else these creatures might be capable of that we haven't discovered yet. So do you think I kept my promise? I said in the beginning of this tour that you will be amazed about the capabilities of these supposedly primitive protist eukaryotes. Well, I was definitely amazed when I first learned about Amoebozoa. Being limited to a life as a single cell did certainly not stop them from evolving amazing features and abilities. Join us next time on another tour on the train of life, when we will explore some multicellular beings. Thank you for choosing Evolution Eisenbahn, take care and goodbye.